Hey everybody, this is Kai Werner from Confluent. Today I want to talk about Apache Kafka for optimization of supply chain management. So there's a lot of different use cases and architectures where Kafka is used in this space. Let's first define supply chain management and then see how it relates to Apache Kafka and event streaming. Supply chain management is a huge and complex topic. It's all about planning and coordination and not just about technology, but also about people and processes, of course. And these processes are cross-cutting. So it's about purchasing, procurement, logistics, and so on. The more and more of that has to be automated to be competitive in this world. And this is not just about new cloud applications, but really about edge and cloud. And this is a continuous process. So Six Sigma is one of these patterns which is used here a lot to define, measure, analyze, improve, and control supply chains. That's the main idea behind that, as you see in the picture on the right. It's really complex and there's a lot of stuff involved, not just inside a company, but also really cross-cutting to third party and partners. A key kind of measurement is the SCORE model, supply chain operations reference. And this is really about the whole end-to-end -end process of planning, sourcing, making, delivering, returning. So supply chain contains a lot of things. And this is not just for tangible goods, but really for everything what you produce and adds value and you want to sell in the end. And we will see this kind of score model during this talk because we need and want to leverage event streaming to improve several processes using the score model here. Before we step into action, let's take a look at the future of SCM. This is an outlook for 2040, so 20 years from now, by the Fraunhofer Institute from Germany. And they analyzed how supply chain management has to change for companies to stay competitive. There is actually not that much surprise here because that's actually what we are talking about all the time, how we want to improve things like being more autonomous with driving vehicles autonomously, machines and so on. And what's more interesting is that everything is connected and communicates with each other. And that's because the infrastructure is changing with technologies like 5G, but of course also because everything is getting software. And all of that has to be fast and flexible. So we are always talking about real-time integration and communication and adoption of processes. So technologies will change, new machines will be added. So this is really a complete game changer how you think about a supply chain compared to the last 30, 40 years. And this brings us to the challenges of supply chain management. The time frames are shorter. So Many years ago, we started with the just-in-time development, right? This is the famous Toyota use case. And then this was adopted across the world, but then new effects came into play, like as it called here, the Walmart effect and the Amazon effect. So uh, I worked with Xperio and supply chain expert on, on two of these webinars, which we can also share, but there we described this in much, much more detail. But, but in general, I think it's clear, as I said on the last slide, it's more automated, more connected, more real time, more flexible. And with the shorter times, there is also rapid change. And this is not just the really big, huge global changes like the pandemic these days, but it's also about more local things like a hurricane, which destroys a region. And so there is rapid change and increased volatility, and there is a lack of visibility. So what's happening these days is that many of the companies change their supply chain so they don't depend on one specific country only and that's not just for the infrastructure but also for logistics for legal and compliance and many other reasons also historical models are no longer viable so in the past we analyzed some processes in a batch mode and then we changed things and um, these kind of variables then worked right you even if you they were dynamic and you could change them but this is completely shifting so that you need to act much more specifically on a region or in a market and so you completely have to adopt your models and ha have to be more at the edge and local to change things independent from other effects which happen somewhere else on the planet so this is really simply getting much much harder where everything gets connected 
And with that, of course, you have a, a chronic lack of visibility. And, and that's not something new, but that's a problem for many years. But in, in the last 10, 20 years, it was still okay. Even though you had European MES systems and had some kind of automation, it's still like um, at the end of the day, you, you order for the next day. And, and th this is not good enough anymore. You really need to act more proactively. And th that's how the tools today work and will work in the future in the next generation supply chain management tools. Otherwise, companies cannot stay competitive with their supply chain. And, and that's really important to create much, much better visibility. And again, not just at the end of the day, but continuously. And with that in summary, um, there's a, a huge demand to build an open and flexible and scalable platform so that you can adopt to these changes and requirements all the time, continuously. And this is about higher scale, about more processing in real time. But it's also very important to be on the one side open and standards based and on the other side still secure and infrastructure independent. And depending on your company, many of them need to roll this out multi-region or even globally. So this is the common demands we see in, in, in huge supply chains these days. And with that, we come to event streaming for Apache Kafka because it obviously can solve these kind of challenges and many of our customers do already. Before I get into the topic, just my one or two introduction slides again. So if you've never seen event streaming in Apache Kafka, so the main point is that Event streaming provides the capability to analyze data in flight and process it continuously. So you can integrate with different systems. Not all of them are real time or streaming. Some of them are batch, some of them are files. But then you can take this information and correlate it continuously in real time at high scale for high volume with high reliability. And that's the main idea of the event streaming platform with Apache Kafka, which became the de facto standard for that. And with this, in the middle, you have an event-based real-time storage system, which can process millions of events per second. And on the other side, it also stores the data so that you decouple the different producers and consumers very well. This is the very different change to a messaging system or to another traditional middleware because it's really decoupled. The sensors continuously produce data. They don't ask if the consumers are falling behind or are down. And because Kafka, in contrary to our messaging queue, is also a storage system, it really doesn't matter and it still um, continuously works without downtime. And of course, there's also other characteristics like that you have rolling upgrades and you can really scale up easily from three brokers to hundreds of brokers. And in addition to that, Kafka also has capabilities to do data integration to both things and to sources, both for legacy, for proprietary technologies, and for modern cutting edge stuff like machine learning or analytics in the cloud. And you also have stream processing capabilities to really continuously correlate and pro uh, process the data. That's another huge added value because that's where the, the, the value shines in supply chains, where you don't want to send data from A to B in real time, you really want to use the data in real time. And all of that together, that's Apache Kafka's event streaming platform. And that's the reason why it's used so much in supply chains and in many other projects. But in supply chain, it's even more important that this is really a hybrid and multi-cloud architecture. So of course, everybody's a cloud first strategy for new projects. That's fine. And even here, often people have to go multi-cloud. So um, while you might run Azure or Google in the US and Europe, in, in China, you probably will go to Alibaba or Tencent cloud because there is no Google cloud, right? So um, the only other option is to use your own data center there. And then on the other side, you also have to go closer to the edge, which can be a local data center or a real edge like a factory or even a restaurant or retail store. So we have more and more customers which are deploying Kafka in the retail store or in the restaurant to do edge analytics and edge processing and also replicating the data to the cloud. And this is why you need to be very flexible here. And why customers then choose Kafka is because they can deploy one single infrastructure in different environments, at different scale with different SLAs. But you can configure one kind of concept and deploy it everywhere the same way. And that's the great thing about Kafka. Yeah, well, and there, why Apache Kafka for SCM? I mean, that's more or less the general characteristics, which are also the reason why Kafka is used in other uh, cases. But the point is really, again, the combination of real-time messaging at scale for mission-critical workloads, and on the other side, the storage and data integration capabilities, so that you can also correlate the information. 
And the most important part here is really that on the one side, of course, Kafka is used for big data analytics, where you combine it with your data lake, with machine learning, and so on. But on the other side, Kafka is also used more and more for transactional data. So it's pretty common that um, your MES and ERP systems are integrated with Kafka, for example. And actually, many of these next generation MES and ERP systems are also built on top of Kafka for the same reason. And therefore, there's many good arguments why Kafka is used so much in SCM. Here's just a few of the use cases. So you might have seen this slide from me um, from, from past decks, but this is now really adjusted to supply chain use cases where we either want to increase revenue by building a new business platform or improving the customer experience. That's like creating the visibility for the customer or doing an optimized um, sales demand forecast in real time, depending on the regional contexts. And on the other side, we also sometimes simply want to decrease cost to increase the operational efficiency or maybe migrate to cloud. And that things like bottleneck elimination or maybe capacity planning in a better way with more visibility in real time. And the last part is to mitigate risk, like um, reduce the, the risk and costs. And on the other side, implement audit and regulatory features. And again, it's the same. Often this exists for many years already in a batch mode. And now you need to go more the real time way with that, like with a what if analysis or implementing the compliance the right way. So there's many, many use cases where uh, event streaming is used in a supply chain. And this is definitely not all examples. But on the other side, here's now a concrete example for that. This is Bader, uh, a food machinery manufacturing company, and they have built an IoT-based and data-driven food value chain, as you can see in this picture. So what they have built is a single source of truth across the food value chain, and this is used to monitor their business critical operations, so tracking, calculations, and alerts, for example. And the architecture is very interesting. So this is running, in their case, fully in Confluent Cloud, or in a serverless Kafka with consumption-based pricing and mission-critical SLAs. But what's really interesting, it's not just about Kafka and, and sending data from A to B in real time, but also about the fully managed connectors so that they can also integrate with their other systems in the cloud, like MongoDB or an object store like S3. And on the other side, at the edge, they connect to MQTT devices via Kafka Connect. And this can be internal systems, but this is also external systems like GPS and weather information from third party services. And they also use KSQL in their case as a fully managed service for stream processing to continuously process the data. Again, that's often where the real added value comes into play with Kafka. So I think this is a great first example for how you can improve the supply chain with event streaming. But let's now focus a little bit more on different architectures and use cases. And I have a few more examples from companies herein. The first one is decoupled microservices. And that's really important for supply chain optimization. This means in the end that you can develop different applications independently from each other. And that's important for different reasons. I already mentioned before that one key piece is that uh, if sensors produce data via MQTT, they don't ask if the SAP system is ready to consume all this data or maybe it's falling behind. Or on the other side, there's the data scientist who uses Python and he has not a real-time system. He's consuming some kind of batch data and then he trains an analytic model with a tool like TensorFlow on that. So all of these applications and domains and business units are decoupled and independent from each other in an ideal world. And that's where Kafka can help because in, in the middle, you have the heart of event streaming with, with um, um, a real-time messaging layer, but it's also used for decoupling and integration. And in this way, each business unit can use their own technologies and build their own use cases. And all of that highly reliable at scale in real time. And that's really where Kafka shines, even if some of these systems are not real time. So it's still fine to integrate with your SAP system um, with request response or maybe with some proprietary interfaces, like in the case of uh, SAP with BAPI and IDOC, for example. And that's the great advantage of using Kafka in the middle and what makes it so much different from traditional middleware, which you may, might have used in the past here, like an ETL tool. One example of such um, decoupled microservices is used at Porsche. So they have done now a, a, a few great presentations and material how they use um, the, the supply chain optimization with Kafka. 
And here's just one example of such a screenshot where they use it in the same way I showed you in the last picture to do asynchronous and decoupled communication between the different systems with Kafka as event backbone. And here is one of the um, platform managers from Porsche says um, they're using this across a range of contexts, including warranty and sales, manufacturing and supply chain, connected vehicles and charging stations. So this is really for end to end creating um, data correlation and visibility in real time at scale into all these different kind of parts of the supply chain. And like in all my examples, I, I also added a link so you can read the blog posts, the talks, the podcasts, these kind of example um, companies do. The second um, architecture and use case is about standard software and custom applications. This is also a key piece because Kafka does not solve every problem and often you want to buy a solution for something. Um, that's also not different from the past, right? So um, many customers heavily invested into one specific vendor like SAP or Oracle or, or Siemens or something like that. And that's totally fine. The problem, however, is that supply chain management means that you typically have to use a slew of technologies and products. So you always have these options of um, buying or renting or making or mixing all of that up. And even if you go just to one vendor, right, you have plenty of different products. They all are often different code bases. They often are acquired. So it's not like you go to one vendor and have one specific solution, which is very well integrated. Um, no, that's not available, no matter to which vendor you go and no matter if it's a software as a service, if it's uh, on premise or if it's uh, maybe even open source, you always will have different products. And often that's okay because um, sometimes different products, even from different vendors, um, do the best for a specific problem. And so it's often a mix of building your own applications where you want to differentiate and buying standard software and adopting into your use cases. So a clear trend we see is that customers build a postmodern supply chain management and, and by that also an ERP system with Kafka and other applications. I really like this term, which was coined by Gardner several years ago, because it actually explains in detail why people use Kafka in this case. So you use it to replace legacy monolithic and highly customized ERP suites and other supply chain tools by a mixture of loosely coupled exchange of the cloud based and on premise applications. That's the definition Gardner gives. But if you think about that, that's exactly how I described Kafka before and why Kafka is used so much. And like in this example, um, the core ERP system um, is, is based on Kafka to scale, to be real time, to decouple system. But then you also integrate with many other systems and some of them might also use Kafka under the hood and some others use some other legacy technologies like XML and web services or a relational Oracle database. Or like in case of a CRM like Salesforce, you only have an interface because it's completely managed by the vendor. And that's all totally fine. And um, even this core system that could be built by yourself with Kafka or maybe use a vendor who uses it. So um, if you ask your favorite ERP or MES vendor, you might be surprised how many of them already use Kafka under the hood or at least are planning to use it for their next generation tool. Because for exactly the challenges I described today, the, the vendors of these products have the same challenges like you do. And therefore they use Kafka for that under the hood. And therefore, it's really not just about their own supply chain. It's really about also integrating with partners, with third parties, with customers. And therefore, um, now where everybody's using Kafka under the hood, so what you also should rethink is if you shouldn't use Kafka more for integration and replication with your partners and customers. Today, the general pattern is to use a REST API here. And that's okay for some use cases, but these kind of HTTP web services don't scale well. It's synchronous communication. It's not real time for millions of messages. And so at some point in time, you might think about some of your interfaces also to the outside world, maybe just another business unit in your company, but also maybe really a completely different company um, can inter be integrated with Kafka. Um, there's plenty of tools for that, like the most cutting edge one is cluster linking from Confluent, which really don't even need other infrastructure like Mirror Maker anymore. It directly connects via the Kafka protocol. And this is really huge and, and you don't have to worry about the different versions because Kafka is backwards compatible. So you don't need to do an upgrade just because your partner does one. And that's a great thing here. So really consider that we see several customers doing that. Like one industry example is in the, in the aviation space. 
And actually, this was where we started this before Corona, um, where people were still flying, but hopefully they will again. But the point here is that the airline is using Kafka heavily for all their airline bookings and um, routing planning, capacity planning for their whole supply chain. And then um, the ticketing system is also using Kafka hell really because, because it needs a high volume of processing transactional data and though they use Kafka for years. And also the airport use Kafka more and more for customers 360 experience and for showing real time notifications about delays and so on. So all of them use Kafka and so they started working using Kafka together to get this information in real time because the rest web service didn't scale for that anymore and it wasn't good enough. Just to give you one example here. And another specific example um, for a supply chain optimization is a real-time inventory system. So that's really huge and we see it across all the retailers because they have so many new strategies where you buy online and then you pick it up in a store, for example. And this is only possible if you have visibility in real-time into all your stocks. And most retailers don't do that today. And Walmart already started that years ago and, and they heavily rely on Kafka as their heart for that. So that they can on the one side integrate all of their different um, systems and different infrastructures and regions. So um, this really includes all of the different centers like the distribution center, um, the stores, um, the partners. And with that, they implemented and integrated the order management system, the, the transportation and logistics and so on. And, and, and you see where this goes, right? This is this huge volume here and a lot of stores. And in, instead of using that in batch like in the past, um, which doesn't work for today's use cases and requirements, they implemented that again with a central nervous system around Apache Kafka and event streaming. So that's really an exciting example for optimizing the supply chain with Kafka. Another key use case is improving the score matrix. We have seen the score matrix before, right? So um, this is about all the, the processes and steps to, to have the supply chain, planning, sourcing, making, delivering, and returning end to end. And here's just um, one example where you um, step down into that from a higher level one scope into um, a deeper sc scope like um, um, make and build to order. And then under that, you have different steps and business activities again, like um, issues to product, produce and test, package, um, stage product, and so on. So in the end, this is the, the process framework um, with which you typically work with in some kind of way or with an adoption of that. And so let's take a look at two examples where Kafka can help here a lot. So um, one key piece which gets more and more important is supply chain planning. Again, and, and the key here is really most of that in real time to answer what if questions in the right time and the right context. That's really important. So that's the most important part. And as, as one of the SCM experts well known said, um, you need to have sensors in the ground. Then SCM becomes a process of sensing and responding. And if you think about that sentence again, this is where you should use Apache Kafka and not a batch system or some kind of web service for, right? And here is one example of that architecture. Um, this is taken from a presentation from Thoughtworks. So this is the consulting company behind Martin Fowler, who you might know. And, and they have explained in a great way how you can leverage Kafka to move from a batch oriented um, planning system to a streaming microservice platform around Apache Kafka. In the end, here really it's nothing new after what you have heard in this talk. It's about decoupling the systems from each other using different technologies, um, having a, a stateful continuous process of events, correlating the data. Um, to analyze these things like, um, is a bid offered on something? Is the shipment created? Um, is the sales order created? All these kind of things. And what's also very important and not just for this process, but in general is that um, this is really using typically the strangler design pattern, which means a big bang typically doesn't work because in most cases you do not start from greenfield with your supply chain, but you have something in place already. Um, only if you build a new business, you can start from scratch, which is great to implement it. But typically you combine existing systems with new systems. And, and this is where the data integration piece of Kafka comes into play. And it's totally okay if some process, processes are not real time yet because of the decoupling with Kafka that still works very well. And so you can do a step-by-step -step, um, um, approach to, to migrate from batch to real time and to introduce new systems with Kafka. And that's part of why it works so well. 
Another part of the score model is also the purchasing in the end part of the of the delivering. And um, I just want to pick one example here. We could give so many, right? So, but I like to give you a specific example. And what we are showing here is now supply chain processing with um, real time natural language processing for digital contract intelligence. And I actually picked this example because there's a great one on the market, so which I will show you in a minute. And first of all, however, um, if you have never seen my talks about Kafka and machine learning, um, how that relates also is hopefully very obvious for you. So uh, machine learning is typically two things. It's, it's taking historical data and train models on that to find insights with algorithms in a batch mode. But then you need to deploy these models to production to do real-time predictions. And then you also need to have an online monitoring infrastructure for all of that in real time. And so this is really where the Kafka infrastructure shines for that, both for data integration, but also for data correlation and so on. Um, I have many other talks which go into that in more detail, but this is really the high level overview. And one key advantage again is that on the one side, um, you use data integration with Kafka Connect for to all the systems, but then the data scientist can use a, a Python um, Jupyter notebook um, for training the models. And then on the other side, you can deploy this model into a scalable Java application for real-time predictions of millions of events. And this is really where Kafka shines also to solve this impedance mismatch between the data science teams, between the production engineers and between other the business domains. And the one great example I have here is from BMW, and they have built an industry-ready natural language processing service framework based on Apache Kafka. And as you can see on the left side, this is used, for example, for digital contract intelligence, for doing smart information extraction and search, for doing automated risk assessment, for doing plausibility checks and negotiation support. And this is, by the way, just one use case where BMW is using this framework. In their Kafka Summit talk, which I also have linked below, um, they also explain many other use cases for that framework. But the heart of that is Apache Kafka for different reasons. Um, of course, it's all about this scalability, real time, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, the, the other key reason here is that um, it's an orchestration layer where you decouple the systems and still integrate them well. And the reason for that is that um, BMW knew from the beginning, they will have to use different machine learning frameworks for this. Some will be Java, some will be Python, and some others will be uh, natural language processing cloud services from Azure and AWS. And so per use case, and over time you can even change the technology in one use case, um, you can connect to these different technologies. And um, therefore BMW here is not just using Kafka, but also the stream processing layer so that you can um, correlate the data and, and have a stateful insight about all of that. And the other interesting part, in addition to all, to all of these machine learning stuff, on the right side, you see they also integrate with Elasticsearch and Kibana so that they have a dashboard on all of what they're doing with Kafka. So this is completely decoupled from the machine learning scenarios um, and shows how really Kafka can be used for many different kind of technologies. Because in this case, Elasticsearch is not real time. It's a near real time indexing for text search. And most of the machine learning actually is also not real time, right? At least not for the model training. And so um, you combine real time, near real time and batch, all of that with one decoupled infrastructure. But the key is that the heart of it is real time and scalable with Kafka. And then it doesn't matter if one end system is batch. But if you put a data lake in the middle for a batch system, then you cannot connect a real time system to that anymore. And that's why so many people use Kafka here as hard. The next use case um, is about a digital twin and the digital thread. So this is also obviously pretty common in um, the supply chain optimization processes. And of course, this is also a buzzword, right? So um, it's really important to define what you mean with a digital twin. I also have another talk just talking about building digital twin with Kafka, if you're more interested. In, in, in this here, I really define as merging the physical and the digital world. And in the end, it's a living model that drives a business outcome. No matter if it's a car, if it's an engine, um, it can be a very small device, it can be a big thing, it can be a building. That's how you have to define it. And in, in kind of cases like healthcare and hospitals, it's even a human as a digital twin because you want to monitor that continuously and, and act on things proactively. And a key piece we see in, in most um, industries these days about a digital twin is the servitization. And 
the key here is like on the right side an example what Rolls Royce does for many years already is the power by the hour principle so you don't sell a car and then you get some money in by some repair work but you really more offer subscriptions so it's really a service which you provide and on the right side in the McKinsey picture you see why they are doing that so it's not just about producing and selling machinery the added value for the customer but also the most of the revenue and profit and margin for the for the enterprise is by also continuously selling software and services with the machinery and that's why the subscription model also comes in all to these things like a car or any other thing you, you, you want to buy so I talked about a digital twin now. Um, another term used here is the digital thread, which more or less spans the entire life cycle. And, and these terms really, you have to define them how you use that. Other also use a digital twin to monitor it end to end. Um, that's really up to you and, and, and both terms um, are, are good. But the point is really that you continuously monitor tangible goods and map it um, to a digital twin where you can then um, do simulations on that and also um, have a historical analytics data on that and all these things. I want to show you two examples here. And again, I have another talk which talks about that in more detail. The first example is where you have a, a Kafka as integration platform for the digital twin. This means that the digital twin is still is, is not built in Kafka, right? It's its own technology, which might be a commercial product or maybe an open source framework like Eclipse Ditto, which was built to build digital twins um, based on MongoDB in this case. And um, Kafka is used as integration layer to decouple systems and integrate with all of that like on the left side in this case with um, continuous data from MQTT and OPCUA, but also from transactional data like your ERP system. And on the other side, you do integration and, and keep state, but then you integrate it with the digital twin and also with other systems, which also consume the data. That's part of Kafka and why you don't use just a digital twin typically, because other systems also want part of the data. And again, on the right side, it's the same story. Some are real time, like the inventory manage management system, and some other are more um, web service based, like a Salesforce integration. And, and this is just one example of how you combine the chill twin with Kafka. And to show you one example for that, and, and here it's also interesting because um, in this presentation, which Audi um, gave um, at a Kafka Summit keynote again, they talk about how they built the connected car infrastructure um, to replicate data in real time from all the cars on the street into Kafka clusters. And actually, I'm um, here, the, the analytics part uh, is, is, is not Kafka, so that's tools like Spark and so on, right? Um, so the, the big point here is also, um, they're not calling it digital twin, so it's, it's just a buzzword, and no matter how you define it, but um, it's used for real-time data analysis and swarm intelligence, um, for predictive AI, um, for analyzing things. Um, so even if you don't even define a digital twin, you might build one and, and don't know it, right? So it's just a, a term, but the key is the added value for your use cases here. And another example is really where actually you build the digital twin with Kafka. And um, this is the same story, but instead of using another tool or technology for building the digital twin, you build as part of your Kafka infrastructure. This has always pros and cons. Um, the big pro is that you have all the features of Kafka under the hood for digital twin, and um, many of them are required anyway. Like um, you need to be able to um, have all events of a digital twin. You need to re be able to reprocess them. You need to be able to take a look at old events of the digital twin to do simulation, to do analytics, to an train analytic models. So Kafka provides a lot of features out of the box for the digital twin. And Here's yet again another example where this is built like this. And this is Bosch Power Tools. So Bosch is a worldwide supplier and manufacturer. And Bosch Power Tools is one of their division. With, and, and even just they have several different Kafka projects. The one I want to talk about here is, once again, it's not called a digital twin. But actually what they are doing is um, they are monitoring all the devices and machines in construction areas. So this is a, a track and trace tool in the end uh, for construction site management and for collaborative planning. You have inventory and asset management. You track, manage and locate tools and equipment anytime and anywhere across all the different construction areas. While the um, event streaming part is running in Confluent Cloud, fully managed in one cloud infrastructure. And 
now you can again define it like this or not, but this is in the end um, a digital twin by this definition, where you have all the events from all the sensors from the machines in the construction area, from all the workers which use in the in the construction area, and then you have all these historical events and you can process that in real time or do analytics on top of that for doing simulations for the next construction area, for example. And this is where Kafka is the heart of this kind of digital twin, right? And now let's come to the last use case. So this is architecture and use cases with blockchains. And I have to talk about this when I talk about supply chain management, because I, I think really that um, blockchain is one of the few use cases is supply chain where this really makes sense, right? So um, blockchain is a lot of complex technologies. I really like them. And I played around with Ethereum and Hyperledger and so on. I often simply think that, um, well, it, it's too much complexity for many use cases where you don't need that. And however, supply chain management across different third parties, which you don't trust, that's where a supply chain often makes a lot of sense. And again, like for the other talks I have, I've done a, a webinar with a partner here where you, we can dig much deeper into when to use blockchain with Kafka and how to use that. But first of all, Kafka is not a blockchain, right? That's also very important. So um, it has many characteristics of a blockchain and also be careful that um, many blockchain products on the market, they are actually also not a blockchain by definition, but they are just a distributed ledger, similarly like Kafka. And as you can see here, um, many of the characteristics of a blockchain are available in Kafka together with some other advantages. Most blockchain, like, like Bitcoin is best example, they don't scale well. Um, Kafka is a, a real-time, highly scalable distributed ledger with many of the advantages like an immutable log and a distributed log of records, replication, high availability, and so on. So, so you have most of the characteristics you need for your supply chain. A few things Kafka misses, however, for a blockchain is being tamper-proof on disk you can encrypt all the data in Kafka, but it's still, in theory, not tamper-proof on disk. Um, you don't have encrypted payloads out of the box, and um, it's not really built for cross-company. The good news is that um, be being tamper-proof and to encrypt payloads, that's pretty straightforward. And there is um, even open source solutions available on the market for that, and, and we're doing that for many customers. So that's easy to solve, actually. And I talk in my webinar with a partner about that in more detail. The only real thing where I think where you don't need only Kafka, but a real blockchain is when you talk about cross company integration where people you don't trust. That's the only reason where a blockchain is really added value and you really need it. So here are the two examples from a Kafka perspective. Many of our customers actually use Kafka and blockchain because they build something like a trading platform. And therefore, they use Kafka to do all the real-time processing and data correlation at scale. And also to integrate on the one side with the trading markets, like with um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and many others. But on the other side, they want to build um, a, a native um, good trading application, which is um, scalable in real time. So like the trade republics of the world, right? Which also use Kafka under the hood, by the way, um, but more or less for cryptocurrency integration and by, for integration with all the rest of your ecosystem, both real-time and batch applications. So that's the one common use case. So here Kafka is not really the blockchain, it's integrating with them. And the other thing is where Kafka really is built as a blockchain. Um, so that, that's really where in the end um, people use Kafka under the hood of a blockchain to leverage its advantages and characteristics, like we have seen on the last slide. But on, on the other side, um, you still integrate with other systems like at the bottom you see. Um, so of course, this is more complex and not that easy. Um, some blockchain frameworks like Hyperledger use Kafka as, as option under the hood. And I also know a few blockchain startups which are built completely on Kafka to leverage these advantages and, and solve the problems other products have with blockchains where you can only process a thousand messages per second instead of a million like with Kafka. So these are the two options from an architectural perspective, and you can evaluate if one of them makes sense. Or maybe if you just take another blockchain project like Hyperledger or Ethereum. So let's summarize this here. Kafka or, supply uh, or blockchain for supply chain management. So in most cases I have seen really, Kafka is good enough. So um, you can use it inside your infrastructure and in your enterprise for building open, scalable, and real-time solutions. It's very flexible and you can build many use cases around that. So that's the huge pro pros of that. On the other side, um, 
there is use cases where you can use Hyperledger Ethereum or such a framework. Again, in my opinion, the only real valid reason is when you need to deploy over various independent organizations and you don't trust them. This is for specific use cases in supply chain management. And this is where a blockchain is really good at. But a blockchain is so complex and immature these days, and it's really hard to implement it. And I've seen too many projects which failed after the pilot because it's so hard to deploy this cross company. And so then um, people really instead implemented their own solution and integrate it with partners like in the past. In the former section, I've shown you how customers use Kafka under the hood and then also integrate with other Kafka systems. That's often the better way and much, much easier, definitely. But in the end, of course, it's up to you. Um, you can also use Kafka and blockchain together, as I've shown you, to combine the benefits of both. Um, just really think about and, and answer the question, do you really need a project with a blockchain? In many cases, I see the answer is no at our customers. And in the meantime, at least they learn that they have to ask this question and if they can really a proof that they need one. In most cases, they don't. So to conclude this session, so what's all of that related to Confluent now? Well, I mean, Confluent um, was founded six years ago by the inventors of Apache Kafka. They got venture capital and built a company to make Kafka enterprise ready and to bring event streaming to the world. And actually that's what already happened. So today, I think really this 80%, that's the official number, this is not true. Almost every company is using Kafka for different projects. So the rise of event streaming is here and cannot be stopped anymore. And Confluent is a key piece of that. And what we're doing is we are helping our, our customers with this journey, because what's very important, most of the use cases I showed you today, it's not something you can implement a month. A supply chain is really a complex thing with a lot of um, brownfield stuff. And therefore, we help with this journey from um, initial awareness, which you might even do by yourself. It's just open source, right? You can't do even production by yourself. But then we help often with the pilots, with bringing it into production, and then we roll it out across the globe. So that's in the end where we help. And of course, um, with the expertise, with um, support, um, with training, with consulting, but also with a lot of products around Kafka. And that's really the, the business model of Confluence. So we are doing Kafka and just Kafka but that we're doing well. We have over 300 full-time engineers at Confluent, which just work on Kafka and this ecosystem. So we are not just doing 80% of the commits to the Kafka projects and all the integration tests and releases and help with that for the community, but we are building a lot of products on top of that. And this is for different reasons, for um, making operations much easier, for mission critical workloads, for monitoring, for development, as you can see, a few of the examples here, right? I don't want to go into products in this talk, but there's many of them for data governance, for security, for multi-region and global deployments, and so on. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's also very important for you in supply chain to have the freedom of choice how to deploy it. Either in a self-managed version, which you can run even at the edge, which can be a factory or retail store, it can be in your data center on Kubernetes or by metal, or you can even use the fully managed cloud service with consumption based pricing and serverless characteristics, which is available on all major cloud providers. And then you can use any combination of that for hybrid architectures or multi cloud. And that's in the end why Kafka helps so much and why so many people come to us with their Kafka projects and event streaming in the supply chain scenarios. I hope this was a good overview for you. So if you have any questions, let me know and any feedback. If you didn't like anything, please also let me know. And please feel free to connect on LinkedIn or Twitter to stay in touch with me. Thanks for watching and hope to see you soon.